Kia ora and welcome back to the Full 90 Podcast with Jacob Spoonley and Nick Hyde. We are back, back after a couple of weeks off, back into lockdown and back discussing football. Heidi, what is good this week, mate? Well, unfortunately, nothing is good this week. The sun is out and I'd be loving to play football for my beloved Bazzers. Big, big shout out <laughs> to them. Um, so, yeah, it's been horrible to watch all this football on TV, watching Bayern smash Barcelona 8-2 and, and here we are sitting in their houses unable to play. Yeah, well, look, we've got no guests this week for Heidi and I to talk to and, and no one to share in that sunshine. But we do have Mark Peer, the big boss here uh, at the 490 Podcast. So, Mark, what's going on, mate? And are you going to add to uh, anything we're going to say in terms of football today? I'm going to add very little in terms of the football side of things. But I did want to say I was excited because we were about to, we were about to unleash. We were about to head to the Eden Park Studios. We are about to get people nice high def views of both your faces uh, and the topics and the guest you were bringing in. I was excited to hear that you, we were going to be, th- we had a referee all lined up ready to roll. Um, we and, did. And, and then, and then no. Is, the te- is it the technical term being punched in the balls? Is that what you referred I, but, to it as before? I know, but it sounded too painful on a Sunday to, to be, to put, be pulling that out uh, live on it. But yeah, no, it's very, it's very much felt that way, didn't it? Like we were all, geez, we were not too long, weren't we? Weren't we, weren't we world leaders with our, yeah, we got rid of COVID. I know, I know. Back in the garage. Well, I mean, to be fair, we we could still quarantine in um, Eden Park, and that, that's probably one way forward. But yeah, definitely looking forward to getting into the studio. Uh, we've got um, some wonderful guests lined up because football is kicking back off all around the world. Um, so perhaps a quick overview of this podcast. Uh, as I said, it's going to be Heidi and I talking about football. So kicking it back to more of an original style format. So we've got Kiwis around the globe. We're going to aspirationally be talking a little bit about Ronaldo, which is Heidi's kind of throwing that one into the mix. And then we've got the A-League. Uh, yeah. The Phoenix. And then we'll finish off with a bit, perhaps a little chat about the the, uh, the National League there. So, Heidi and Mark, jump in here if you think he's mispronouncing anything. What is happening to some of our former uh, pod guests, but mostly the lads around the globe? Well, yeah, you hit a nail on the head there. I, mean, I, I deliberately avoided Scandinavia like the play or like COVID <laughs> because the names are just getting worse and worse as more and more Kiwis head there. But let's uh, go to some of our, our biggest stars. Sapreet Singh has taken a loan move from Bayern to FC Nuremberg, which plays in Bundesliga 2. Uh, I think it's a great move. Uh, he won Bundesliga 3 last year with the reserve team at Bayern. As you've seen, Bayern's starting lineup at the moment is unbelievable. They're playing wonderful football. Rather than sit on the bench and pl- carry on playing in the third league, he's taken a year-long move to the second league. I think hopefully it'll be one and done for him, like a basketball term. Uh, he will be able to get one good season at FC Nuremberg and be straight up into that Bayern team, hopefully going forward. So, Two good points move, about though. that height. Absolutely yeah, great move. Um, so first of all, he's going to be just down the road from Henrik Plowman. Who is uh, my best who, mate who will lead him astray? No doubt. <laughs> I should. If you told me that beforehand, it's all over. So exactly. Singh's career is done. Get him out of Germany as quick as possible. Exactly. So for those of you who don't know, Nuremberg uh, is um, the local club um, for Adidas and Puma. So Adidas and Rudolf Dyser obviously set up their companies, Puma and Adidas. And Adidas is headquarters. It's really weird height. It's like imagine dropping a multinational headquarters into Coatesville. The, the, the campuses are spread out. There's a whole bunch of rich people, um, obviously the executives and management, but there's no like downtown. It's not like a, a bank or um, a big commercial entity. It's very, very strange. The second thing is Winston Roof has come out and said that like the championship is, the second Bundesliga is probably the most competitive league. So this is going to be a great chance for Sarpreet to really hone that kind of uh, competitive nature of his and to make sure that he's ready to go and he can kind of, start stretching those shoulders and making sure that he's got some space in the Bundesliga landscape. Yeah, I always take those comments with a grain of salt because I'm like, you know what? Sapreet was a very young teenager and young man playing in the A-League with a bunch of Aussies and Kiwis. And Aussies and Kiwis are known to be pretty tough. I'm not really sure second division Germans are going to be any tougher than a bunch of ugly Aussies kicking the crap out of them. So... (laughs) Anyway, there you go. Moving on, Ryan Thomas. Uh, unfortunately, he's had a bit of an injured preseason. He did get back on the field with a start this morning against Vitus Arnhem in a 1-1 draw, so it's good to see him back playing for PSV. And was it a friendly hug? Yeah, mate, of course it was. All these games are friendly at the moment. Michael Vald, uh, he has moved on from his... Uh... Go on. Here we go, Mark. This is the first one. No, he's he's now at Almeri City. It's, yeah, there it's you quite, go. Yeah, there, there you we go. go. It's quite quite easy. Underarm, mate. That's way too easy. <laughs> way too easy. I know. 
So, uh, look, uh, as he mentioned in the pod a while ago, he was looking to get more game time. He'd only played, I think, four or five matches uh, previously in the in the top league. He's now playing second division. I really hope he can knock uh, his way on the, on into first team goalkeeping there and, and really make a career for him because I do think he's got the attitude for it. Um, still and in the Europe, Dutch accent. Dutch accent. Still in Europe, your, your buddy here, Jacob Brian de Vries. Obviously, he has uh, a bit of an article on him going to Sligo Rovers in Ireland. Okay, he did this quarantine Sligo? here. Was that Sligo? Yeah. Sligo, yeah. How would you like to say it? <laughs> Just the way I said it. I got, I got the, the Rovers bit right because it's right <laughs> here. I got the, sort of. So it's very good. Um, so he's scored an assist. Sort of, unfortunately, not doing too well. They're about ninth in the league there. Nico Kerwin's side got promoted to Serie B. Joe Bell continues to start for Viking in Norway. But they are only a point above relegation, though. So also of note uh, around Europe, guest of the pod a while back, Paul Eiffel, mentioned to the media that he was on a podcast recently talking about Libby Kakache and now he has two championship offers. Hopefully one of those is Sheffield Wednesday. There you go. I'm not now, sure. Yeah, was that on ours? Because he said he mentioned Libby and Cal and I haven't listened back to any of the pods. Did he mention that on us? Well I wouldn't listen back to our pods either, so I'm not sure either. <laughs> there you go. Anyway, over to the States and what is possibly the worst named football competition in the world, the MLS is back tournament. I mean Yeah, really, Major League is, Soccer. Yeah, that's awful. Anyway, Bill Tui Loma's Portland Timbers won the whole thing, which is great. Unfortunately, Bill didn't get too many minutes, but anyway, you got a you got a trophy, so happy as Larry. Uh, Boxy's Minnesota team got knocked out in the semis. Um, he was playing regularly. Unfortunately, James Muser just got uh, basically a couple of minutes, and Noah Billings, the other Kiwi there, has been loaned to the Las Vegas Lights. Now, that is a loan move I would be happy to take. Yeah, any I got- sports team in Las Vegas, I would sign up for. I got, I put that up on Twitter and um, everyone was like, oh, you know, COVID, you know, all that kind of, they've got COVID positive tests and stuff. I was like, yeah, but everyone's getting COVID positive tests at the moment. So I'd much rather be COVID positive in Las Vegas than somewhere like, like Salt Lake City, for example. Exactly. All right. Close to home. Um, just quickly, can I just ask, uh, with the Major League Soccer, do they give out championship rings like they do in the NBA and they'd give out them in the NFL and stuff? Or is it just, a, are they trophies? And are they called world champions? Have they Ooh. taken on the world champion status? No, they haven't taken Major on the league. world champion. That's good. No. That's good. See, that's a wrinkle, isn't it, though, Mark? Because if every other American champion is a world champion, are they implicitly admitting that they're not world champions? I feel is- like I feel like the football crowd in America, and I'm talking about the soccer football, not the American football. Mm. Um, they're a little more woke. They're a little more awake to the sense that the rest of the world plays their sport and. Um, they have a World Cup that they actually compete in, and whereas there is no World Cup of the NFL, is there? And the NBA FIBA championships is not yeah. really a, No, yeah. it's it's a philanthropy. I oh, yeah. So I feel like there's word. some real solid proof that you're not actually world champions. <laughs> so they can't actually call themselves that? I don't know. No, no, I, I get what you mean. I'm just, I'm just trying to penetrate the Americans' kind of attitude towards this, not what everyone else is taking for granted. Um, it's an interesting one, though. Yeah, and look, I think the thing that we're probably we haven't touched on is that Noah, James and Boxy were in the epicenter of the Black Lives Matter kind of reinvigoration. And, and that seemed to be an incredibly scary place for a long time because of the, the tension that was there. I had a chat to Boxy about it. He's like, no, it's all good, man. Like I just kind of drive by it and stuff. And I was like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> just it's real intense. low key. Yeah. Yeah, he's seen the high bar for being low key. <laughs> <laughs> All good. Anyway, closer to home, Gianni Stensness, who's probably the Kiwi in the A-League that gets the least attention. 25 games for Central Coast this year, so good start for him. Any relation to Lee? No. Unfortunate. Yeah, I know. That's what I thought Um, as well. Yep, Michael Redent, uh, Matt Redenton obviously went to Brisbane Raw, been playing four games there. Now, Rojas, who we spoke to. Can we just jump in on Redenton? So we were 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 having a chat, I think, before the Brisbane uh, Phoenix game. And um, we were like, oh, actually, Matt's kind of come in and he, we were trying to figure out his stats and bits and pieces of what happened. So ended up texting Michael and uh, his response was just, yeah, and I've told him to fucking cut his hair as well, which I felt, I thought it was hilarious. Your old man's just chewing you out, hoping it gets on national TV. You know what? This long hair thing is is definitely a thing. I mean, I look at it, I was watching the Phoenix game and I was watching Callum McCowart and I watched him keep stroking his hair the whole time while he missed the goal. You're talking about Nick Sink? I'm um, just like, you know, if you've got long hair, it's like having the, the colored boots. You've got to be displaying, you've got to be doing everything right. Now, if as soon as you do something wrong, all the old conservative idiots like me start going, oh, if you cut his hair, he'd be a much better player. <laughs> I don't know. What's your thoughts on that? Are you saying that there could be a cheeky haircut if Cal McCow came back and tried to play for the Bazers? 
I'm just saying that the short back and sides maybe be concentrating on this football a bit more. You know how it goes. <laughs> Mate, if I could instead, grow it, instead I doing would. a social media, instead of doing a social media on Instagram, he'd be, you know, yeah, yeah. Hey, if they're, well, they're, they're at that, that age where if they can grow it, like just go for it, right? And the yeah, people and, and old me standing on my lawn yelling, "Get off my lawn!" Get you've just and yeah, they're at that age. I think you've just given away the whole game plan there, mate. Yeah, it, yeah. So uh, yeah, perhaps a little bit old and grumpy um, on the pod. I'm going to jump in. I'm going to say. Uh, yeah, if I wasn't working in um, in corporate, I'd definitely get the man bun out and grow it. I'd, that would be me all over. And then you just get more pissed off and never record the podcast. I think, to be honest, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd go and talk to your wife about this. I'm sure she'd be on my side. <laughs> anyway, so that, uh, that's let's a talk lot about of Kiwis Marco overseas. Rojas. Yeah, let's get Marco Rojas. Marco Rojas, 10 games back, six goals. The guy is just unbelievable. And the goals yeah, he scored sweet. has been incredible. Uh, he is, oh, oh, I want to compare this because no offense to Costa, but Costa's played 26 games and scored eight. Yeah. Rojas has just come back 10 and six. Um, and Costa has been playing in the top team. So, you know, great to have both those guys on the pod, but I think it just goes to show, you know, Marco Rojas is just a star that we just don't talk about enough. I reckon we anyway. possibly try and get him back on and, and yeah. kind of understand what's going on in Melbourne Victory, hear from him since he's been back and maybe do it in a way that everyone else can hear as opposed to last time, Hyde, that was... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, I wanted to touch on that because it's kind of led me into the A-League and mm. the Phoenix appear to have dropped the ball, but they're not the only ones. Sydney, who are the best team by far, haven't won a game since the first one back against Phoenix. They've gone five games without winning. It's it's almost like the top sides have dropped the ball. Um, sides like Western United and Brisbane are doing particularly well. And I just want to point out to you, mate, we did the podcast, probably pod three, and we picked our A-League. I got five of the top six boom just like that and yeah. also pick central cast to come last so i think that's a pretty good pick that's not bad that's not bad from you um i think melbourne victory was a team that kind of screwed everybody over in the predictions didn't they they were yep. going to be top three i think for people across the board um yeah i i haven't i haven't done compared myself against that criteria hide but i think i'm probably four or five as well so adelaide united was the one that was the difference between us and they have well you would have picked melbourne as well so you would have been yeah you've been four yeah right? yeah exactly yeah. So but anyway, A League. Um, so I think that yes. Yeah, should we go? Uh, should we go into that now, Hyde? I mean, it seems yeah, like a natural jumping yeah, off point. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's start with the Phoenix because that's what everyone's been focusing on on this side of the Tasman. And you'd think going into the restart, Melbourne City only have two games to play. The Phoenix have uh, six games to play. Uh, they've only got us. I think it was a four-point gap at that point in time, and. You're back in the Phoenix all the way there, Heidi, because they, they've got second, they've got it in their sights, they're a form side in the competition going into lockdown, and the wheels have just come off, haven't they? Yeah, so if absolutely. You look at it, if you look at it, last um, the, the last the, the results since restart, a loss against Sydney, um, we had a win uh, against Perth, then a draw, then a loss, then a draw, and then a loss. So we've picked up five points of a possible 18, and this is the really concerning thing for me, Hyde, as I started making my way through the stats. Goals four since the restart, or in the last five, sorry. Goals four, five, goals against, 10. That's a negative five goal difference. Compare that to the rest of the season where they, over the course of the games that they played into lockdown, they got 33 goals over those games and they had 23 against. So they've conceded a third of the goals of the course of the season in the last five games and they've got nowhere near the goals that they have scored. That is quite frightening. Um, I've gone into a little bit further shots. So across the last six games, we've had 79 shots from the Phoenix in total. It's an average of 13 uh, per game. And then there's been 21 on target over those six games. That's three and a half. That's just quite simply not, not getting the ball in and around the goal enough for me. So we'll, we'll jump back into that and, and go through the details of it. But that is quite stark. And I don't think stats always tell the true and full story. But in this case, they have shed a light on what the Phoenix have been like since the restart. I mean, Mark, you can jump in here if you want, mate. But Heidi, anything from you as well? Yeah, I think a lot of it's personnel. If you look at the changes to the back line, that probably says a lot to why they've been considering goals. Right back has become a problem with Tim Payne out. Uh, hmm. It's not been free-flowing. Fenton came in and, and looked short of a gallop. Um, Kellen Elliott has actually been a shining light on his matches, So, but he's still very inexperienced. Uh, and although he might be playing well with the ball at feet, it's all the positioning things like that and the combinations that, that count. Hmm. Um, De Vere has been in and out. Obviously, he got rested. He also got suspended. So that's been uh, a bit of a 
I guess, wake up call for the Phoenix at the back. Um, going further forward, um, the the midfield doesn't seem to be quite gelling as well as it used to. Devlin's still running around making the tackles. Um, Steinman's playing well. I, I think they're trying to pro- possibly fit Roofer in when he doesn't need to be fitted in. I, I don't know. Maybe it's with the extra games. And then when we get up front, I guess one of the real problems for me is Davila's form is, is terrible. Oh. Um, he wouldn't be playing if I was picking the team at the moment. He's he is the star player who's just not delivering. He's no assists, no goals, no nothing. It's it's fallen off. Um, and then if the rest of the line, Ball, Piscopo, Soterio, McCowett, all look way too lightweight to lead the line. They're all very similar players. Without Hooper, we are a shit streak. Sorry, but yeah. he is he is the player that that pushes the opposition back. He's a, a big unit. He bullies them, and he's a menace. And he gives them the freedom to play. The rest of them all play the same way, and they're very easy to, to, to mark and play against. I think. How much? How many? Uh, what's what's the big personality changes and personnel changes? Sorry, that have happened since the break to where they are now. Are there? Is there anyone blatantly missing, or is that what you were just saying then, Heidi? Is there someone who? really was carrying this team that, that has dropped out? Well, I think, yeah, as I mentioned, the, the disturbance at the back because the combination between Taylor and Devere has been rock solid and they've had a pretty standard back four of, of Kikachi, Devere, Taylor and Payne. Payne has now been removed from that at right back, so we're kind of missing one. And, and in those six games, I think Devere missed two of them. Um, so it kind of threw a, a bit of a spanner in the works that the combination is not the same. And anyone in football will tell you having a consistent back four and a goalie behind them that are, they're used to be playing with each other always is fantastic. Setting the table. Been there. Yep. I, yeah, because I, I think, I, cause, yeah. I mean, from the evidence that we have from other sporting events or sporting leagues that are that have started bubbles or a starting isolation sort of idea, we've got the Warriors who obviously have taken some a long time to get used to not seeing their family, playing in and out, being over there and staying over there for some some amount of time. And then the NBA, which is an interesting one to me, where they create a bubble over in Orlando and they have teams fly in. The, the best example, I think, of what's when you've got the top teams who aren't performing and it's the lower teams that are making all the noise can come from the NBA, where they invited, I think it was four extra teams on the Western side because they had a chance still to make that eighth position and make the playoffs. And it's those teams that went hot. It was the Phoenix Suns that went 8 0, and they had a mindset. They knew that they were heading into this. They had a damn good chance. Well, they've got no chance really, but they if they played really hard, they'd get it. And the top teams really haven't, they hadn't made much noise yeah. at all. And those, the last couple of weeks, the top teams have been shit. And then you've got those lower teams who are dead hungry for it and are leaving their families and have a chance to, you know, go the next level. Those are the ones that are making all the noise. And I wonder, is there any similarity there with what's happening in the A-League where it's the, the lower teams who are making all the noise because there's a chance? Yeah, I think you've hit the nail on the head there, Mark. And if we step back and just have a look at um, a, an accompanying point there, the Phoenix, for a long time, they were, I think, in their own minds, as much as in the public's minds, were batting above their average. They were pushing really hard for that second spot. They had games in hand. Melbourne City were not necessarily falling over, but they were missing opportunities. And... When Melbourne City, who are sitting in that second spot, weren't taking points and the Phoenix were creeping up on them, the Phoenix were looking up. They were hunting down Melbourne City. Then the lockdown happens. Coming out of the lockdown, it's now the Phoenix that have got games in hands. They need to um, chase Melbourne City. And everyone starts talking in the background about second. So it almost becomes an assumed point. And when it's an assumed point like that, the psyche, I think, changes from we're hunting second to now if we don't get second, we've lost something. So we're losing Mm -hmm. out on something. We've basically, you know, games in hand, it's almost like you've got a perfect um, schedule. So you're counting the missed points instead of the points accumulated. So it's that change in mindset for me that I think started eating away at the Phoenix. That and they, um, I think they're insecure. I don't think they've ever done well at this point in the season when they've got this high. So if you look at the likes of Sydney, Melbourne Victory, Melbourne City to a certain extent, they're used to being up there. They've, you know, they, when we talk about that Australian arrogance, that's what we're talking about. Um, Bling FC and Sydney, they've got the swag. They know that they should be there. They're used to this time of the season, and they know they can turn the screws on teams. We but Sydney can't it. be happy, mate, because look, no, no, they, no. Historically, yeah, I'm talking I think about they're that, exactly what Mark's talking about, because Sydney were top guns for so long, they haven't won in five games. I know they were the rested players, but there's no coach in the world that will tell you that going into the playoffs in sudden death matches without winning one in five was part of your plan. This is historic though, height, and I think this is where you look at the, the arrogance overall. So Sydney, they've won minor premierships, they've won the competition in past seasons. Yes, they've fallen over in lockdown, um, but 
they are used to being there. I don't think the Phoenix are used to being there. I think that's kind of starting to mess with the Phoenix's mentality a little bit, that they feel a little bit insecure about that. Coming back to your point, Mark, absolutely. We've seen Brisbane and Adelaide have a change of coach. Uh, they've had a change of squad. Players haven't returned uh, since the restart. And instead of going out and looking to grab journeyman players from across the A-League, they've brought in the young boys and they've mm. done really well. So um, Carl Vett at Adelaide has just basically promoted three or four academy players. They have come and they are hungry. They don't care. They're not used to the pressure of the A-League. They are simply trying to take their opportunity to get a contract and play well every half or every 90 minutes. And that for me is... I think a bit of a blueprint for the Phoenix for next season, potentially that give these young boys a chance, let them go out there and play for it. Because I think the A-League will look radically different next season as opposed to this season. So, I mean, how, yeah. how horrible is that? If you're headed onto the field and you know, you've got a, a bunch of young kids who want to steal your stuff and all you're trying to do is keep second, like you're, you're, you're trying to keep points or you're thinking about other things like, Oh, we're losing, you know, we're losing our chance to get to second place. Those two mindsets collide you've got one team that's firing because they, they want to steal your stuff, right? And the other team that's like, oh my God, we're losing our stuff rather than, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So um, in terms of the Adelaide uh, team, they were in free fall, weren't they, Hard? I mean, we've taken yeah. the piss out of me in a previous podcast. They were in absolute free fall. I think they lost like four on the bounce, restart hits, and they are all of a sudden not necessarily winning all games, but they are within a goal or they are drawing games that they arguably should have lost. So that game against the Phoenix, for example, um, 1-1, one, one. and that was a frustrating result for the Phoenix. The other the other um, team that we just touched on, Brisbane, so Warren Moon, another former player, knows the dressing room really well, brings in people that are young and hungry, uh, have a little bit of A-League experience, like Matt Redenton, who pops up with the goal for him. So it's that sort of mentality. Yes, it's not always going to happen, but I think in terms of um, on that knife's edge, it's just starting to tip the way of those that are rolling the dice and taking a chance and backing their young players. Now, not, that's not a knock against the Phoenix who have given young players an opportunity. It's just the mentality. Those players are, those, sorry, those clubs and those teams are hunting the playoff spots, whereas the Phoenix are like, well, we've already qualified. Yeah, I don't, think it, opportunity? I don't think it's all doom and gloom just yet. I mean, I, nah. I think uh, return of Hooper and Taylor to, to Sudden Death Football, both those guys have the right mentality to lead the team well. And by my reckoning, Phoenix are actually quite lucky. We get a free-falling Perth first up in the in the playoffs, and I think that's the one team you do want to get because they're just dreadful at the moment. Well, let's jump into that, Hyde. So why have the Phoenix been this bad? You touched on the back four there, um, and yes, they've become a little bit more unsettled with the loss of Tim Payne, who I think was a bit of a low-key, very significant contributor for the Phoenix over the course of the season. Having Libby down the left-hand side, I mean, your, your star's not always going to shine as bright when you've got somebody like that. Um, but Tim Payne, I think he was that settled and calming influence. He's played a lot of football at, a, at higher levels in the A-League um, for the, such a young man. And I think he gave a relatively calm and stable hand to that um, Phoenix's right-back spot. For me, though, it's all about what we're doing with the ball height. I think teams have worked out um, this 4-2-2-2 formation in possession. Uh, if you look at Sydney, Sydney is another team that you've touched on that has struggled since the restart. I think during the, the lockdown period, teams have actually figured them out and they've looked at, for example, and this is becoming a lot more relevant, 3-5-2. And it's not a 3-5-2 that we saw during the regular season where teams are wanting to go out and press the Phoenix. Um, I remember against Western United, the Phoenix absolutely dominated them in uh, Victoria. They won 3-1. And the Western United were almost arrogant about it. They went out and they wanted to dominate the Phoenix, they wanted to press them. And in doing so, that exposed Western United's passing lines. So, sorry, they allowed the Phoenix's passing lines and exposed Western United's press. And that's what the Phoenix want to do. They want to get in and amongst you. They want to get the ball in between your midfield and defense. And then that's when they can really attack you because they've got the numbers further forward. What we're seeing from teams now is that they're deploying a lot of people behind the ball. It's very conservative. And then team, and then the fence can hit on the counter-attack. And we've oh, seen that I, over the last couple of games. Yeah, Newcastle I, was a great example and Sydney nah, as see, well. See, for me, Newcastle was a bad example because they got the ball wide so many times to the right and left fullbacks and there was no one in the box to cross to without Hooper in there. And so they checked back and that is when you get people behind the ball. We never got to the byline and pulled the ball back. I actually think there were plenty of chances against Newcastle to win that game easy without the breaks then magnifying the issue. That's the issue though. They're, 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 they are being conservative. They're not looking up and they're not seeing those gaps that they can play into. That would no, be they're a, not playing direct, the direct enough. They, they're chopping back and playing position in the, in, the, in the top third and they need to be far more direct. 
And I think well, this is where I disagree. This is where I disagree with your Rufa point before, which is where is Alex Rufa being shoehorned into this midfield? For me, Cam Devlin and Steinman have been very predictable. They're trying to move that ball uh, and get those nice, cute passes in between lines. Rufa's going direct, mate. He's bringing a little oh, bit of variation. Look, I'm, to I'm not saying that Rufa shouldn't have been there, but I don't think uh, Devlin and Rufa would be the combination uh, in, in that case. I think that you should have uh, Rufa and Steinman. That, that's all I was trying to say. I, I, no, no. I think I totally agree with you. Rufa's uh, pinpoint delivery and crossfield balls is exactly what's needed to free up players going yep. forward. The well, Spoons, you've, like... you've, you've literally just given us all the answer, right? Like, this is, you, that's, you've said predictable and, yep. and, and, and not uh, not playing direct with, with your two things that need to change for the Phoenix to be able to to go to the next yep. level. So I, I just can I just touch on something that we, we sort of touched on just shortly, very, 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 very small. And it's the the idea that the Phoenix are not used to being at this place at this time of the season. It's that habit of winning. And I want to throw this at both of you. How many years does it take, do you think, of a team making the playoffs before that habit of winning becomes just that a habit of winning like how many years with the phoenix for you guys who cover the game and also fans of the team do they need to be consistently hitting the 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 playoffs before you would say yeah these guys are are used to this they're comfortable here they they're there for me i think you go ahead oh sorry mate you look for me mark um i can only talk off personal experience it's just one as soon as you break in, as a, as a, whether it's a young player or a senior player, I played a lot of years uh, for a team Mount Longford when we first started, and we were a very young team, and we were always just missing the playoffs, just out of the bracket. Uh, and then we had one season where it clicked, and from that season on, we went about 10 years where we never missed kind of the top four. And I just, you know, I honestly think it's one. As soon as you break it and you can do it, it's like anything in life. It's like riding a bicycle. Once it's done, that should be your goal every single time. To ride a bike. I like that. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> well, I know what you mean. I yeah, know what you yeah. mean. Yeah. <laughs> so for me, Mark, that's all based on a foundation of a decent culture off the field. And we've definitely got that. We've got them spades. So Stephen Taylor, uh, Piney wrote about it a couple of weeks ago that he, for Piney, is probably the MVP of the season. And I agree with that because... Where did Piney get that idea from? Spooners? <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I had a little nibble him about that. But I haven't read the whole article yet. Because uh, it's premium content. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, it's one of those things. So, I, uh, yeah, so Taylor's given them that foundation off the field. And I think with that, Heidi's right. It's a season to prove to themselves that they should be there. And they had that momentum going into the uh, lockdown period, which is so frustrating. And I think that's why people are looking at them with that, critical eye now and saying guys this isn't up to standard this isn't the phoenix that we saw earlier in the season they, they as Heidi said it's not all doom and gloom they finished th- they'll, they'll likely finish third in my opinion and that's a great season i mean it's up there with um an historically good season for the wellington phoenix so they need to then go out and prove to themselves either during the regular season by running away with the competition or pushing a a team like sydney hard and then they also need to go out and get to a grand final. I think that's the key for me to say, yeah, we, we you know, we're definitely good enough here. Um, so so that... the speed wobbles that they've had, and they've come out of lockdown, they've got the speed wobbles, right? To be yeah. able to sit down and, like you just explained before, say, boys, here's a couple of things that we've worked out. One, we're not playing direct enough. And two, it's a little predictable. So here's how we're going to change that. Clear your minds. You belong here. You're ready to go. Now go take them. Absolutely. I think that's it. And look, there would be no one else that I would trust more than Ufuk Tale and Chris Greenacre to do that. Hmm. Both incredibly experienced hands. They're just going to sit the boys down and say, stop overthinking it. Stop overcomplicating it. Yes, um, Uli's getting the shit kicked out of him every time he gets on the ball now. And he is, to be fair. And I think the referees have not done a good job about protecting him or actually supporting the Phoenix and getting the right calls after the lockdown. And VAR, Heidi, is oh. probably something they've got to touch on there. But look, it's the finishing as well. The finishing has been shit. And it's yeah. what we've seen from the Phoenix earlier in the season. Um, and that's not piling the pressure on them. I think everyone's trying to do a good job. But it's just, we haven't put goals away. So you look well, at the I think results. it did pile the pressure on. That, that, that was the Newcastle game. We should have been 3-0 up at halftime. Because yeah, they missed exactly. everyone. You've been a goalkeeper long enough. You've probably watched t- teams that blunder 10 chances and the other team gets one chance down the other end it goes off the guy's shin pad in the top corner and they go on and win the match. And and it's, it is because you miss those chances. And if, coming back if, to that, 
the expectation point, Mark, which is what you're getting to, which is you know, when do we expect to be in the final series? When do we expect to be part of that conversation at the end of the season? At the moment, like a little subplot in the Phoenix games is we're not finishing well, so we expect the opposition to come back with that sucker punch. And that's the frustrating thing. And I think the fa- I don't know about you, Hyde, but the fans at home, and when I'm sitting in the studio, I'm thinking, oh, that's another good chance missed. Oh, that's another one. And then it starts playing. Oh, what happened last time? Oh, we got hit with that shit goal. And that's what it was like against Newcastle. Was it a, it was a deflected goal, wasn't it, Hyde? And you're yeah, like, and as, soon as, as soon as they brought Abini on, I was like, he's going to score against us. I yeah. just, he just looked, he just looked at him and he, he just, he went onto the field and you just looked at him. Oh, you went, oh shit. He actually really wants to score. You could just Ooh. see it in him. Yeah. And sure enough, boom. You know, those, the, 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 there's teams, right? Where they get a lot of beef because they didn't prepare well for the game because they thought they just needed to turn up and win. Are the Phoenix yeah. the exact opposite where they don't expect to win and that they, they don't expect I, I to score this goal or they don't expect to, I don't know. I think they're overthinking it, Mark, and I think that's it. I think they're really well prepared, and they're like, we've got to get this part exactly right. right. And it's like, no, no, guys, like, it's part of the wider picture. And you can see that, like, Piscopo's really trying to bring in, like, Kellen Elliott to provide width when earlier in the season he was just playing. And uh, they, were, they were just they were, they were free-flowing. They were going forward. They were attacking with um, confidence. So, yeah. But, Heidi, come on, man. Like, let's be I- honest. How many penalties have the Phoenix not been given since lockdown? Like against One. Sydney, against Western United, against Newcastle, there were horrific calls. There were Mate, three against Newcastle. This is exactly you just you just you're a philosophy happening. Now, when you blame the refs and not getting penalties, you've fallen to the trap of every other Phoenix fan. All oh, the world's against us. No, it's not. we're playing well. We're playing well. We're not scoring, get a, but at the same time, we're not necessarily getting the penalties that we deserve. That's what right. I, that, you're I mean, for, it. You're looking for a penalty as the way through the, the problem. We should be sticking the ball in the back of the net. And to be honest, the last penalty we had, we missed, didn't we? So let's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, see, that's adding into the wider narrative. Look, yeah, I agree I, with you. I, I, think, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't believe that, though. I don't believe that we're looking for that silver bullet in terms of the referee. I think it's just part of the narrative. We're not finishing well. We're dominating teams. We're going to get counterattacked. But at the same time... Oh, and we'll never get a penalty. The psychology is negative. It'd be wonderful if we got one of these calls. Uh, look, I think Mark hit the nail on the head. The tele is going to go in there and say, look, fellas, you're third. We're three games away from winning the title. And yeah. I think that is exactly what's going to happen now. I believe Hooper will return. We're playing Perth first up. We're going to win that game comfortably. Um, the boys. And are I think it's good that we've got three games, like, to be perfectly yep. honest. Like, I, I if we were playing this bad and going into a semi final, because if you're in that semi final, the team that you're playing has obviously won the. Well, it's not. Why do they call it? Like, the, yeah, the minor semi final, sure he's called yeah, it. They got they've won that minor semi final. They've got momentum. They're coming in. And in that semi-final, you're one game away from the final. So that expectation that we've talked about, that missed opportunity that the Phoenix are probably feeling at the moment, that would be amplified. So I think it's great that we've got this extra game to correct this, the, the course that we're currently on. Can I just ask, has there been, a, um, has there been a, a lot of noise around the league? Like The Warriors get a lot of kudos for, for the sacrifices they've made, leaving their family, basing themselves over in Australia. It's non-stop. Like the chat from the Australian media, from the other teams, from Twitter, all that type of stuff where they're saying, you guys are heroes. You've allowed the NRL, NRL to go ahead. Is it the same kind of kudos having to the Phoenix, or is it just <laughs> yeah, white not, the dis- not in the disciplinary tribunals, Mark, but um, yeah, <laughs> everywhere else there is. No, but that might, be a, that might be a culture thing too with, with the way things are seen. I mean, let's let's be honest the general feeling around football is that there's a lot more discipline around the training and how the players have to prepare and look after themselves. And unfortunately the league has just let themselves down or shit themselves in the foot all the time. So for a bunch of league teams to actually stay in quarantine and behave themselves is almost seen as <laughs> angelic. Whereas the footballers are pretty much expected to do it all the time. Yeah, I mean, true. how many footballers have you seen have breached the, the rules? Whereas how many league players have breached the rules? hundred percent. And I mean, coaches. Yeah, I mean, so so I don't think you're going to get uh, the fact that because the Phoenix are doing what everyone else is doing, whereas if you look at the league, the Warriors are actually, they're doing it right, but every other team is not doing it right, so therefore they're seen as, as being awesome. I just think, you know, if you've got this third-place team and they held the league hostage by saying, you know what, we're not, we're not going to come over, we're not going to leave our families, we're not going to base ourselves over here, we're just not going to do that, it would look a little odd come the playoffs if they wanted to restart the league, and the Phoenix weren't there. So that sacrifice that they are making. And it, I mean, as much as 
a, a couple of players came back from the from the Warriors and they've taken a bit of heat from people like, man, you've got no idea to sacrifice. You're a professional player. You should be over there. Mate, all that kind of stuff, though, must must affect your brain. Must must yeah. not work well. Especially if you've got young players, man. That's pretty, pretty cool for the young players. They get to you know hang out with the lads a lot longer than they would usually. But... Yeah, but when it's uh, RTS and he's got a wife and two young kids, that's it's it, that's really rough. Yeah, you know, yeah. and um, you know, I did, you know, six to eight months away in Brunei twice. It's not that's not simple. Yeah, it's, it's not you know you, you don't have the same. It's not like you can go down the road and catch up with your, your good mates and that. And you can use computers as much as you like and you can carry on doing these. But um, you know, it's called isolation for a reason. And uh, there are certainly times that as much as you enjoy being around your teammates and that. There are long hours between training to fill in. In 2008, Mark, we did, uh, I think it was two months away before the Olympics. So we, we'd we been in camp for a month in Wellington and then we went across to Jakarta and did uh, two and a half weeks there. And then um, there was another like uh, two to three week period um, in, in uh, Beijing. And it sounds horrible to say, but by the time that we actually found out that we were knocked out, like the, the, the atmosphere in the group just changed. And uh, it's a combination of, you know, obviously it's relief not being under that pressure any longer, but at the same time, you're like, Oh, I can actually go home. <laughs> yeah, okay, I can go. I, I'm not going to be in a hotel room. I'm mm-hmm. not going to, and these are nice hotels. Like it was really good. But at the same time, just having like the freedom to walk outside and go and get a Coke or a coffee. It's quite nice. Uh, so the boys at the moment, the, the feedback is that they're doing it they're doing it tough um, because they've been away for such a long period now and they've got that that last mountain that they need to climb. But they are just, it, it, the boredom's getting to them. The routine, the monotony is getting to them. And that's something I think that's eaten away as well. Compare that to someone like a Sydney um, or, a, um, or, or like a Melbourne city who aren't that far away from home, who aren't that far removed from their families, then I think it's it's... It's probably a really bad comparison, but I just don't think the weight's sitting on them as much as it is the Phoenix. Mm. I, I mean, that the one thing we've learned from the Warriors experiment, I'll call it, is you can only keep a man away from his family for so long. Some will, will need to go back. Broken promises from the NRL is, didn't help as well about getting their families over and having them a part of the bubble. But it just it just seems like they are going through just that little bit more. Even if you can, like you're talking about going and getting a Coke. If you're based in Wellington, they'll know where they go and you get their usual coffees. You know, they'll know where yeah. their, the, the usual things are. It'll just give them that something else they don't have to think about. But in saying that, pulling together, we're over here on a mission. Lads, let's give it our all. We've got no other distractions. This is what we're here for. Can also be, you know, a badge of honor and some strength. Yeah, absolutely. And I think they've cultivated that sort of mentality really well. But the question for me is how much currency is there in that? Because they've been across for the isolation period where they weren't allowed to do anything. And yeah. I mean, Gary Hooper and Ilyas de Vila did that really hard being on their own. Then they've got to go into a preparatory period. Then they've got to play six games and what was it, three weeks or something like that, which is again, it's different piles on the pressure in front of no crowds. And then these are all like, these are little one percenters that they start eating and they start accumulating. Um, so yeah, but mate, I want to make you the center of the pod for a little bit. Mr. Pied. Right. Hit me. National League basketball, mate. You were there. You were the voice of it for a long time. Sells oh, authentic sells, yeah. New York pizza. Yeah, absolutely. What a wonderful job they did in supporting our local basketball game. Um, we've currently got a National League competition that is not uh, really sure which direction it's going. It's a bit rudderless. Uh, can you talk to any of the experiences that you had about potentially a shortened competition? Yeah, well, I thought I thought Justin and the team at the at New Zealand Basketball did a really good job at scrambling. Um, so many things could have gone wrong. In fact, we had Justin on our podcast probably, uh, it was the week of the final games. And he was saying, we asked him, you know, when did you think this wouldn't happen? And he said, all the time. There was so many different stages where I was thinking, no, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. How do I get a group of six teams all to be staying in one hotel and then make them play four, you know, four games a week and then organize it in one place and have transport and the amount of things that they went through to make it happen. And then everything started to fall into place. Things like getting an ESPN contract where we could now broadcast our sport because the lack of sport worldwide was going to be, you know, it was going to be good for ESPN. Um, things started to fall into place and people started to learn that, hey, 
not only have we scrambled here, but we've actually put something together that's really, really good. And the players were really, really into it and really, really good. And the organizations, yep, there was a bit of toing and throwing. And hang on a sec, what? We don't get our usual roster? We're going to do a draft? Yeah, draft is really cool. Everyone who watches basketball in the NFL, they love the draft. Let's, let's do it. And that brought attention on board. And then it just slowly picked up momentum. And by the end of it, if you weren't at the games in West Auckland, come on, I mean... I'm a Tiara Two uh, boy, so it didn't bother me. But it was just down the road in Henderson. But they held it in West Auckland at the um, at the Trust Arena out there, and it was hard to get it's through. A good, it's a good facility, though. It's, it's a great it's a, facility. It's a great facility. It just just happens to be in West Auckland, and it's a, it's just shitted to get to when you're on a Monday. Uh, sorry, a Tuesday night game, a Wednesday night game, a yeah. Thursday game, and a Saturday game. Those are just terrible traffic times. And as Aucklanders, you sit there and go. Yeah, no, I'm not going to have time nah, to get to that. I'll give it a miss. So the crowd numbers weren't huge. Start there. But they got their product out there and the amount of support they got from the sponsors and new sponsors who got interested in it simply because they were calling it the showdown. It was the NBL showdown. It's just, you know, these teams are going to go hard for the next six weeks and we're going to, we're going to find ourselves a winner at the end of it. it. It worked. And it took a lot of... It took one person with a massive amount of, uh, I guess, foresight to go... We can't not have an NBL season because if chutzpah. we do, yeah, the chutzpah to do it. Yeah, it? that's the word, and um, and it worked. So I, I don't know whether you can do that with the National League soccer, football. Well, it, let's but, pause there. Yeah, let's pause there. This is the thing that I wanted because Hyde's put a lot of thought into this. Oh, apparently I might be selling them. Okay, you are just throwing me under the bus with that call. We'll right. judge that. I mean, we'll be the judge of that shortly. I don't even know right. the question. But this is, and this is where I think in this country, sometimes we get very conservative. So what you're saying is someone thought, well, shit, we're not going to have basketball unless I go out on a limb and let's work back from the best possible scenario and see if we can make it happen. So it's that making the plan from where we want to be to how we're going to get there, as opposed to being like, oh, well, we can't really do much at the moment. So that for me sounds like it can translate that attitude and approach just absolutely bugger it all we're just going to go for it and if it needs to be hide a tournament that lasts two to three weeks maybe that's what it is or maybe it's a six week um tournament where you play twice a week i don't know what the format looks like but i like that approach and i 100 percent big ups for you again behind that um mark and uh justin what a great job he did hide is that something that is starting to get the cogs turning yeah, I mean, I look at the, I mean, to give some context, our National League is pretty stuffed um, at the moment with, with what's happening. It, it's a real shame because there's a lot of quality players playing in it and it's led to a lot of very good performances at Club World Cups, but it, it appears to have run its course. Uh, we now have teams like Otago and Canterbury, or sorry, Otago and, and Tasman pulling out of the competition. Um, whether that's financial or COVID related, you can't really tell. Clubs are struggling. Uh, fan base has disappeared. The, the franchise model doesn't appear to work because like me, if I'm wearing a Glenfield Rovers shirt, am I going to go and support Waitakere United playing at Western Springs? No. Mm. But, but I should. That's my local team, apparently. So there's a, there's a real missing connection there. Um, whether it's summer or winter, again, seems to be a problem. Um, so we've got... But why? I don't, I don't understand I, that. I, you know, I don't got, get the narrative, move it to winter and it's going to solve everything. It's, it's no, it, either, either do I, because it was moved to summer for a, a very good reason. Um, the mm. standard of, of play in the winter in the crowds and it's pouring with rain in, in June, July and August is never going to work. Playing in summer definitely got big crowds, but the marketing behind that, and it's something we New Zealand football have to look at, why why is there not a team, say if it, was, it happened to be uh, Hamilton or Tauranga, not playing at the Mount over New Year's? You know, where people, like cricket do it really well. You yeah. know, so so why aren't a Friday football, night what, game hide? Why, why, aren't, why, aren't, why aren't Tasman playing over that summer period at home when everyone goes into Kai Territory beaches and stuff like that? Like it just, no one seems to think about these things. Or why is, uh, for example, Otago's game not being held in Queenstown? Or, you know, those things don't take a lot to, to fix up. But I think we we got a real problem in the fact that there's so much division over what goes forward. Um, there are probably only eight to ten entities that could afford to run a, a, a team now. And they really need to be sourced out and not on geographic location anymore. It's like any sport in the world. You, you, if you're a good player, you've got to travel to where the team is. You look at professional sports people in America, they trade their teams all the time and happily move across the country because it's their job. Now, I know New Zealand football is not quite the same because it's, it's, it's amateur, but the reality is if you want to get one of those contracts now, you look at the young players, they're moving to the Ole Academies or Auckland United's Academies anyway. So it's already happening. 
there's there needs to be a massive shakeup. I think basketball has shown how to do a massive shakeup and done yeah. it really, really well. I, I look at it and go, I'm envious. I'd love to see something like even the draft. I mean, I know it sounds crazy, but imagine you know it leveled the playing field didn't it and made every single match entertaining you look at their table it was <laughs> any team mark, could have won be, it. mark you're gonna jump in the football draft to do this one? Oh, uh, hey if it's eligible for anybody I'll, I'll go for it i just had a couple of thoughts can you do a north versus south in new zealand football i'm just trying to because yeah. i mean yeah. if, it, if it's if, if yep. it's going to be too expensive to get all the clubs why not do a state of origin uh north versus south and the South Island teams versus the North Island teams in the best of three, and you held it, held it at Westpac, and you televised it, and you'd I, do something cool with it. I, I, would, I would jump in there, and I'm just going to say two hubs, Mark. So I think you need to keep the clubs or the, the, the uh, teams intact at the moment because mm-hmm. it's just going to be a fucking nightmare trying to get uh, North versus South, and, and there's going to be politics and a lot of a shot, but I like the idea. Mm. I reckon you go Auckland hub, Wellington hub. Mm-hmm. And you bring this because it's a South Island team now. Tasman and Otago are going to feed into Canterbury United. Bring them up. Um, you're not always going to play all the games there, but at least then you've got logistics where you're just moving perhaps Wellington to Auckland, which is New Zealand's most regular um, flight path anyway. So I think that that for me, if I'm looking at how do we replicate what basketball did, it's not going to be identical, but it's got this. You can do something with it. And then the thing is, like, get into the the schools and and get them down. So if if your mum is from Christchurch and you're in Wellington, you know, like um, make sure you adopt the, the Christchurch United team or the Canterbury United team. Just get in there and, and, and try and figure out how you can get some fans along to games. Um, and the other thing is, I actually think, as you said, there's going to be corporate and commercial interest in what this looks like. If it's going to be based somewhere, it's going to be there for six weeks. I've got certainty around it. It's going to be on TV. Yeah, why not? Why not throw, you know, 15, 25 grand at it? See how we go. Yeah, the other thing in summer, mate, is that the fields are really good. You can play games back to back to back on the same field. So oh, when those niggly talk- cricket players aren't wasting their time out there, ruining the talk- pitches. Can we talk about the concrete cricket um, <laughs> pitch? Oh. What the hell? It's like a yard off a football field. <sighs> I've fallen over and just smashed myself. <laughs> the worst. That was probably way out from goal. Well, you've got to stop falling over by yourself anyway. <laughs> That's all right. So we got. So it, it's almost like. Um, Oh, wait, club championship is that is that the Chatham Cup? Is that what they they call that? Where you've got uh, the best. That was, the, that was like the FA Cup, right? So that okay. Was yeah. Everything feeding into. So we don't have Harvard regions because football's never had really. It's never been the Wellington team versus. Uh, North it, it did regional probably back, back in the uh, back in the nineties. They actually did um, on the back end of the season. They used to have the provinces playing against each other, and you used to get some interesting results because obviously Poverty Bay had Gisborne in it. But when they were back being strong, so you used to get you know Poverty Bay playing Auckland, which was a a decent match, which you Thomas Edge. Now. Thomas yeah, Edge. Yeah. <laughs> it was my. Uh... But yeah, so many things have been tried. I just don't think we've ever stuck at anything or, or got it right. I mean, but the, this the is league... the great thing with COVID, yeah. right? This is the great thing with COVID, and I, there's not many great things you can get out of it. This is something where you can throw something at the wind and see if it sticks. Like that's throw it at the wall, not the wind. Throw it at the wall and see if it sticks, and that's what the NBL did really, really well. Like. There were teams who have been pulling out of that competition for a while now. They went and got the Hobart Huskies, who uh, run out of the NBL, and then they based them up in Auckland. They took risks, but they just fucking did it. And look, it stuck. And they, it worked really, really well for them. So the same thing happens. If it was me and I was in charge of something to do with the football, I would be making sure that whatever we're doing represents regions, so that there was some tribalism to it, and we were doing it in a little bit differently. We're doing it differently to say how everyone is used to. So if it's regions, we throw them all in a tournament. The winner gets this. This is how the tournament plays out. This is how the teams are selected. Here's the lines. You get to select any player who's playing in this region at this time right now. Get them. We'll bring them up here. Sponsors will pay for the hotels, da 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 and you just go for it. You just got to... Yep. Like it. Let's go for it. I hear that. You know what it'd be great for as well, to finish off this conversation? A team from the North Shore Hyde. A National League team from the North Shore. That would be fantastic. I know what Waitakere United is basically Birkenhead United with a couple from Western Springs. Let's, and this is the thing I think you're talking to, Mark, is that we get so used to politicking and putting things in boxes. Um, just, yeah, as you say, if things need to happen, use this as an excuse to do it. Mm. Uh, yeah, so for we me... We go back to how it was next year. We don't know. But right now... We are we are dealing with a with COVID nineteen. We're dealing with a global pandemic, and this is how we're actually going to run the league. You're either in or you're out. And there were teams that dropped out of the basketball, and I think yeah. they ended up looking at the basketball and seeing how good it was, and going, hmm, because I know there was players who didn't put them make themselves available because they were part of the teams that dropped out who went, ah, 
Yeah. Oh, it feels like I'm missing out here. Yeah. So, anyways. Uh, that's great. And look, I, I completely agree. Disruption is a chance for opportunity as it is like disappointment. So, um, that's fantastic. Hyde, we haven't mentioned it. Last thing, what? Why? Uh, why do you think Renato is underrated? Well, I guess I got thinking. He's 35, so technically he could play in the in the in the over 35 as Bazers, right? So it's, it's something to take on on board. At 35, he's just come off a season where he scored 37 goals in 46 matches in Serie A, and obviously. Um, I went back through his stats. and Look, I was not a Ronaldo fan when he first came out. And I'm not being a Man U fan either. Um, you look at him kind of as a, as a petulant young fella. Um, he's show voting and everything else. But I, over time, I've had to look at it and go, and I'm the type of person that does respect people who are very good at their craft. Three Premier Leagues, two La Ligas, two Serie A's, five Champions Leagues, uh, three Cups, uh, FIFA World Club, Club Cup four times, uh, with Portugal, he won the Euros and the Nations League. <laughs> it's um, 99, in, 99 international goals, second greatest of all time. Wow. 164 caps for Portugal. And I'll go through, look, I'll just read you his last, I don't know, 10 years of playing in top-level football, okay? Last year, this season, 46 games, 37 goals. 43, 28 goals. 44, 44 goals. 46, 42 goals, 48, 51 goals, 54, 61 goals, 47, 51 goals, 55, 55, 55, 60, 54, 53, 35, 33. The guy is playing roughly 60 to 65 matches a year now at age 35. And he's done that for so many years. On top of that, his international play. I mean, we're talking Costa. Costa's looking to play 50 matches and thinking it's a massive deal, which it is. Ronaldo's played 164. He's always available for his country. He plays every single minute of every single match, and he's more than a goal a game. It's it's absolutely ridiculous. It is. And do you know what the one thing that astounded me, and I, 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 I'm not going to get the stat right, but I saw it, and I can't remember exactly what it was. It's something like Cristiano Ronaldo has played 170-odd uh, times in the Champions League, I think. He scored 130 goals. He's yep. responsible for something like 1% of the goals across all of Champions League games or something right. like that. It's, it's absolutely insane. I don't think it is. That. It could be like 0.5. I'm not sure yeah. what it is, but it's just... I it's just thought I'd raise it as... You, you hear the Ronaldo Messi comments all the time, and I just look at the fact that Ronaldo is the type of player that single-handedly wins games. Mm. Uh, I think it was last year in the Champions League, Atletico are 2-0 up after winning in um, at, at Juventus. They go to Atletico... He scores a hat trick to win three two on aggregate. Where um, did you think this up, Whitey? No, were you were you sitting lying in your bath, just bubble bath, everything all over you, and you just sit there and go, you know what? Ronaldo's fucking well, underrated. It, it's it started <laughs> when I yeah, I started when I heard the story um, about uh, who was it? Patrice Evra went to. This is when he's playing with Man U, and obviously Ronaldo is a kind of a he sticks to himself. He's not the friendliest guy in the changing room, so he invites Patrice around for a for lunch. And Patrice goes around there and he gets served salad for lunch. So they have training in the morning. They go around there thinking this would be cool. You know, Ronaldo's mansion, salad for lunch. And then Ronaldo says, do you want to have a kick around? Let's do some more training. <laughs> no, yeah. Ronaldo, I don't. We're just done training. No, that's exactly, no. but you've just is, led me a damn salad. Mindset. This is his mindset and this is why he's so good. And he mm. is so fit. He's always training. He's 35 and he's busting out, you know, he's disappointed he's not the Serie A top goal scorer. He's he's crying when he loses in the in the quarterfinal of the Champions League. The guy is so driven. Mm. I just look at that like a Jordan. He is, I don't know. For me, there used to be an argument of Ronaldo and Messi. For me, for me now, it, it's not even close. Ronaldo at 35 is just still a superstar. Well, he, he doesn't need eight goals good. put past him, does he? I, I'll jump no. in on that before we get into that particular point. I reckon the comparison here is Tom Brady. I I reckon that's where he's going. No, he's got to the point where now he understands the game. He knows what he has to do in order to be at that level. Uh, he knows what he has to do to get those sorts of results. So he is working his ass off to make sure that he can be there for as long as possible. And I think that, for me, is the comparison that you'd make between yeah. Ronaldo and another sports. That's a dangerous yeah, man, right? That's a dangerous yeah. man when you, you are so driven and focused. You've already had so much success, but you want more. That's a dangerous man who ends up as the greatest of all time. Yeah, well, look at that uh, the World Cup game when it was Portugal versus Spain. 
and Ronaldo scores that free kick in the last minute. He just knew he was going to do it. He just yeah. knew if there's one guy in the world that is going to score a free kick from 25 yards in the last minute against Spain, mm. it's him. The, uh, one criticism that I have of Ronaldo is that I think he probably has a little bit too much say on what goes on off the field. So I'm talking about managers. So I think the manager needs to, one, have his own idea, and then he's also got to kind of check that against Ronaldo. We've seen that play out a little bit. So Mourinho, uh, Zidane, um, Sarri's just been replaced, so Perlo's going to be the manager for Juventus next year. I don't think, I think he maybe oversteps the mark a little bit, but coming to your point, Hyde, which is Messi versus Ronaldo. So you mean the teams that where he won two La Ligas and two Serie A titles? Yeah, I mean, I'm talking about the dynamic between the players, the player and the management. Like, I don't think your traditional there won't relationship... Be a, there won't be a fan in the world that is unhappy with winning the league title. Yeah, I feel, like, I feel um, like this is more about, you know, you see a lot of that in yourself, Spoon Lane. Like, like, that's what, how you ran your career, so you can see that, and it sort of niggles you. You're like, I don't think that's a good put on. Coach, take him off. I'm thinking this. Every goalkeeper in the world is looking at this going, oh, just because the guy scores goals, you give him all this money. <laughs> yeah. Cry me a river, buddy. Cry me a river. Oh, no, look, I just think it's, I, I, I just think that he's become used to having a lot of say. The second point is Ronaldo versus Messi. Oh, oh, in the latter years, I think it's become stark. It's really, like, Ronaldo's a team guy. You can see that. Messi, I don't think, you, you don't necessarily see that. Against Liverpool at Anfield, he went missing. In the World Cup final and the semi-final, he wasn't around. He wasn't the guy that was in the middle saying, lads, come on, I'm supposed to be the best player in the world. Get on my back. We're going forward. It was Mascherano in the semi-final, Hyde, or the final that was laying down the law to Argentina in there. And then against Bayern Munich, what in the fuck? Just rolled over. Yeah, Ronaldo would never do that. And I think if you look at the fact that, that Portugal won the Euros in 2016 and the Nations League last year, when there are powerhouses like Germany and France in that around that area, that says to me that he is punching well above his weight in a small country. Yeah, I think that's right. I think when he ultimately retires from football, you might see a dip in Portugal, which you expect, but I think it's going to go more to the fact that he was such a large influence in that team and he gave well, him a lot of leadership. Bearing in mind, they won that Euro without him playing, didn't they? He got uh, injured in the... Is that what, and he's on the sideline. He's given yep. it the bit. He's given it everything yep. for his guys. Um, yeah. No, I, I. I think that's a good little, good little footnote to the conversation. Oh, so have I, have I, have I turned the wheels here? Have I twisted the motion? Ronaldo's. No, no, beats, no. Beats Messi. I just, I, I think Messi for for me for a wee while. You're starting to see he's been very privileged. I think the other thing, the different, different, differentiated between the two, Ronaldo's done it in the Premier League. He's done it in uh, La Liga. He's done it in Serie. A. Uh, Messi has been... Messi's messed up your internet that's what Messi's done mate oh, for staying with one team but yeah I just I think uh, it's um, I think that speaks more to Ronaldo's achievements look I think now we just need to give a quick summary of what we're looking to do um, <clears throat> with the leagues that are kicking off overseas we're starting to see <laughs> the 2020-2021 season making its way onto our screens and um, I've seen our boys overseas playing as Hyde said, so we've got friendlies coming up. So we're looking to reach out to a couple of lads, maybe one or two that have been on the pod before, hear how they're going, trying to get in touch with Ryan DeFries, who sounds like he's a man on a mission to make sure Sligo Rovers doesn't get relegated. Uh, but then the big one, this has caused a bit of shit stirring online, Hyde, and um, we had our conversation uh, hijacked, as it were. Um, the referee. So Nick Waldron has said that he's willing to come on the podcast again. Uh, appreciate referees are usually in a position where they do receive a lot of attention from players and fans. But any questions that you do have, please get in touch with us on Instagram or at our Twitter. Um, the full 90 is the handle, either that or you can get in touch with Heidi and myself on Twitter, or Instagram, and we'll make sure that if your question's good, it will get included in the pod. But um, great to have, I, th I think genuinely great to have a referee coming on and willing to have a chat about things and look it's not going to be all about decisions it's going to be about nick and how he got to the position where he is at now uh but hide any thoughts on that um and any sort of excitement that you might have about this conversation yeah i've got some interesting questions having uh, you know i think it's always a strange part of football the refs they get their own little changing rooms tucked away in the corner and they can't really have a beer with you after the match even they you know some of them are decent blokes you'd like to but they can't be seen to be drinking with you after the game because it's perceived especially if they give you a couple of penalties during the match it can go the wrong way yeah, um, but you know they're, they're a really in part of the 
important part of the game and it's mm. it, it must be hard kind of sitting out to the side all the time because they're not the administrators they don't make the rules um they're not the players um their own their own little breed i don't know you have your goalkeepers union but there must be a referees re- union there must be some goings on inside there that hopefully we can pry open and get some yeah. good stories out of absolutely and get a little bit of visibility over because i think that's what people have been frustrated with at the moment is that we don't know about certain things so to hear a little bit behind the scenes is going to be great uh mark really quickly thank you very much for coming on and uh listening to heidi and i and then also poking the bear where you needed to today much appreciated that's all right i just have two things to leave with one ronaldo will never surpass luis figo for me um and the and the portugal colors that's that's always going to be mine and that's because that's where i was peak football interest and uh and he was he was something special and finally i'm going to start a give a little page for those atari headphone fucking things that you're wearing there heidi because they are horrendous they i don't know these, where you found those little things but they these things, sounds like a these tinny... things came from these are downer issue mate this is this is there's thousands of us given these things it's let crazy. them go downer let them go down we need to get you a new set of headphones <laughs> because they are they're so tinny but i've only really noticed it as you've been actually it was the passion you were bringing when you were talking about uh ronaldo that you sold it to me and i was like man we got to get him some new headphones because if we're going to be stuck in lockdown for a long time, we want some good quality. You've got some big ballsy voices. We're going to hey, get that quality through. Get, get the yeah. get the sponsors out there calling and get sales to deliver some pizzas during lockdown as well, if you That's can, mate. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Good point, mate. We could all be eating and holding pieces up. <laughs> it's been fun, lads. I've, I've had fun. Thank you. Not a problem. All right. Well, look, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, we look forward to providing you with another podcast as my border colleague just walks into the room. Uh, so, hi, man. Last word from you. I'm going to say thanks for everybody and uh, stay tuned because we are bringing you more regular podcasts. Yeah, hopefully we can get into Eden Park soon. I know Mark's done a hell of a lot of work getting that all sorted out and uh, it would be great to get in there and use the stats. So, uh, hopefully, uh, mission fulfilled soon. Absolutely. Thanks, Gaffer. All right, everybody. Stay safe, look after yourselves, and we'll see you at level two or level one. Yeah.